So I want to get, I'm re-recording this for the second time because information keeps coming in, but at this point we're done. Whatever it is, it is, and whatever I missed, I missed. So in the video I say that it was a fifth round pick. It's actually a second and a fifth round pick, which makes it even crazier. However, on the Viking, in the Vikings' favor, it turns out he's willing to actually drop his one-year tender from the $17.8 million down to somewhere around 12 to $13 million. We still don't have the full details in terms of the long-term extension, which they're currently still working on and what kind of a cap hit that's going to be. Um, but that definitely is much more, as I talk in the video, this is way too much money. He's not worth that. 12 to $13 million, he's definitely worth that. So anyways, we'll get into more of the details in the rest of this video, but I wanted to squeeze those couple details in. Let's get into it. So the Vikings picked up Yannick Ngakwe, and everybody's in an absolute panic. Vikings fans are doing backflips. Packer fans, Lions fans, Vic or, uh, Bears fans are all in an absolute panic. Um, I'm not too worried. The Vikings are clearly better as a team. That goes without saying. I would have absolutely advised against this if I was working for the Vikings. You can call me biased if you want, but we're going to go through all this um, and, and kind of look at why, you know, okay. So first of all, let me put the hardest possible spin I can put on this, and I promise you this is the initial reaction from the the very basic fan community, especially the hyped-up Vikings fan community. Yannick Ngakwe is one of the most talented pass rushers. He's the only elite player from that 2017 Jacksonville Jaguars unit that's still remaining, or one of the only guys that's still there. He's dominant. He's elite. He's only, I think, 25 years old. Um, and the Minnesota Vikings just got him for a fifth round pick this is the steal of the century he's an elite pass rusher he's better than everson griffin the vikings are going to be an even better defense than they were last year it's game over for the nfc north look out here we come roughly that's probably what you're going to be hearing from a lot of people um i'm trying to think if one of those things is true <laughs> um We'll have to look at the Everson Griffin comparison and see if that's true. Um, I'm not entirely sure that it is, but um, I don't. I don't know that really any of it's true. the The fifth round pick, first of all, is only if he doesn't match your wildest expectations. For example, um, if he ends up playing really, really well, like you want him to, like you're saying he's going to, it becomes a fourth round pick. And if he plays really well and you win a Super Bowl, which obviously is the ultimate goal, it becomes a third round pick. And I'm not saying you would care. Obviously, you would happily trade a third for a Super Bowl. I'm just trying to make sure we understand properly what we're saying. He's only a fifth round pick if he isn't actually as good as you say he is. So you got to pick a lane. If he's really, really good, then it's not a fifth round pick. It's at least a fourth round pick. So just go around saying he's a fourth round pick. Right, because then you're more consistent with what you're saying about him being this elite football player and all that kind of stuff. That's number one. I would also like to point out um, a few other things. So let's let's kind of back up a bit when we look at this Yannick Ngakwe thing. Let me ask you this question: Why in the world didn't the Vikings do this a long time ago? Why in the world would they go out and get Pierce instead of just getting Yannick Ngakwe for a fifth? Why hasn't somebody else gone out and gotten Yannick Ngakwe for a fifth if it's just a fifth? Every time, and this happens all the time among fan bases, something like this happens, it's always a lower pick than everyone's expecting, right? Yannick is worth at least a first, and then somebody gets him for a fifth, and everyone's like, oh, steal of the century, the Jaguars are stupid. No, you're just not understanding the details. So they went out and got Pierce. The reason they went out and got Pierce, and it's very obvious, this is a defensive head coach who relies very heavily on this being a very good defense, and for a very long time it has been, right? It's That's the forefront of this team is defense, right? He lost one of his linebackers, who's clearly overrated, although he had a very good year last year. At any time there's risk of losing a linebacker or something, they pay him way too much money. Um, he lost Linval Joseph, and he lost Everson Griffin. That's a catastrophe, and this defense is going to get absolutely wrecked. Wrecked. No question about it. So they immediately go out and get Michael Pierce. Michael Pierce is strictly a run defender. But, um, you know, it, at least back in 2018 and beyond, uh, 2019 wasn't that good of a year, but 2018 and beyond, really, really, really elite, sort of snacks Harrison level run defender. So at least you got that. No replacement for the edge, but there's that. Then he elects to not play because of COVID. Panic time again, right? And they go out and try to get, what was it, P.J. Hall from the Raiders, I believe? 
P.J. Hall, who's just kind of, mm, but hey, we got to do something. He fails his physical. Panic, 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 panic. What are we going to do? So they go out and do what they know they shouldn't do. They go out and do something that they can't afford to do, that is not the right and prudent decision that no other team wants to do, and that is trade for Yannick Ngakwe. But the question is why? We're all hearing that he's the best. He's this elite. He's one of the better young pass rushers in all of football. Why wouldn't they do it? Well, let's take a look. Ta-da! Take a look at this. It is the, What they're trading is the contract. They're giving the Jacksonville Jaguars a f conditional fifth-round pick for this contract, which is a one-year contract worth $17.78 million. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, dummy, but they're going to give him an extension and they're going to have him for the next four or five years. Okay, but there's a problem with that. First of all, I don't know that they are. If you're giving up a fifth-round pick, that might just be for a one-year deal. And they might just let this ride out and see how it plays out. And if he's a really elite player, then they'll try to find out how in the world they're going to find money for this because the Vikings are in no position to be giving up this kind of money. They're not in a good cap spot. They're already overpaying their guys. They can't afford this. How in the world are they even affording this? I don't know. So maybe they'll offer an extension, but I don't. if they do it immediately, I'm going to be shocked. But... As of right now, they traded a fifth-round pick for a $17.8 million contract. It is a one-year contract. So if, okay, so then they're not, what are they going to do then? You think, <laughs> do you think Yannick Ngakwe, see, because he can, he can choose not to take the contract. So unless there's already a contract in place, which maybe there is, and they would have had to have worked it out. And that's the thing, they're not, if they're planning to extend him, if they're planning to extend Yannick, they're going to work out the details with him and his agent beforehand. Because the last thing you want to do is trade for him and then say, okay, let's work out an extension. How does, uh, you know, uh, let's see, your, your play's been declining and whatnot. We'll get to that. So how does, uh, you know, $17 million a year for the next four years suit you? And he says, no, thank you. I'd like $20 million a year. And then they're stuck with a one-year $18 million deal, in which case they gave away a fifth-round pick to get Yannick for a year and destroy their cap. And if you're wondering what I mean, destroy their cap, how does it destroy their cap next year? Well, because right now, this is the amount of money supposedly that they have. They have 12.5 million. So how do you pay 17.78 million if you only have 12.5 million? And especially when you want to bring close to 10 million dollars into the season. Generally, that's just general basic GMing, right? You bring about 8 to $10 million into the season because things happen. You want to have a little bit of available cash so that you can pay for a right tackle to come in when your right tackle blows out his kneecap. So you've only got 12.5 and you got to pay for 17.8. It almost guarantees they're going to have to extend Yannick. Otherwise, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to push out money. They can't do it with Kirk because they just paid Kirk and they already pushed the money out, right? So you're looking at what, Riley Reef, maybe? Because these are the guys here, this is money that you can save if you cut them. This is money you can save if you cut them, but also there's some money that can be, you know, if we work a new contract out, because clearly if we can cut you, that puts you in not great territory. It means your, your guarantees are basically all dried up. So how about we offer you a new contract? We'll kind of give you some more guarantees. We'll push some more money out, and we'll lower our cap hit for this year because they have to go up. Again, if they want to go to zero, We've got to get from 12.5, where did it go, to 17.8, right? So we've we've got, uh, let's just call it 6 million just to get to about zero we've got to come up with. So, again, we kind of have to extend Yannick probably, but that's going to be really expensive and we can't really afford that, but whatever. Again, that's, that's their problem and it's the reason that nobody... Nobody, including, I mean, 32 teams, because the Jaguars won't pay him. Nobody's going to pay him. Everybody would be happy to have an elite 25-year-old pass rusher if, in fact, that's what he is. But nobody seems to want to do it, which is strange. And the Vikings, of all people, as much as they need a guy, this isn't the right way to go. This is, you, you can't afford this. And it shows right here. And it'll be interesting to see what they do. They've done a good job of evading this salary cap disaster that has been coming for about three or four years. You're starting to see it crack. Again, they lost Linval and Everson Griffin, and they're losing guys. And a lot of the guys that they have are getting to be somewhat up in age. And, you know, they've lost several safeties. Um, 
and obviously they lost every single starting corner that they had that were all first and second round picks. So it's not going great. And if you add this atomic bomb that is Yannick Ngakwe, that's not going to help this situation. The only way you get better is if you learn to start adding pieces through the draft, and apparently the Vikings are getting into this vicious spiral in which their team is crumbling, and they panic, and they go into the free agency. It's the exact same thing the Bears are doing. Everybody they try to pick up is a free agent. we got to get more free agents because we're purging talent, and we're slowly slipping into despair, and it just accelerates this, pa- this, this problem. It's exactly what happened to the Jaguars. It's why out of 24 elite p- pieces that they had in 2017, there's one remaining now after after Yannick. It's because they went out and got free agent after free agent after free agent after free agent, and it was great for a year. They nearly won the Super Bowl, but now they've imploded and are possibly getting the first pick in the draft. There's a reason why nobody wants to touch Yannick. It's not because he's not a good player. It's because you can't justify it. So let's get to the meat of this, because right now you got Vikings fans as well, some people that are just Yannick fans, and they, they watch ESPN and all these people who have been brainwashing you into believing nonsense that Yannick is, in fact, one of the best young elite pass rushers in all of football, and you don't know what you're talking about, and you're stupid, and you're dumb, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's look at some facts and stats and information and not uh, Skip Bayless or whoever's telling you. I don't know. What, I don't watch any of that stuff. So I just I see this this wave of people on Twitter that just say things and I look at the stats and information and I go, where are you getting this from? Because you're just hearing the same garbage regurgitated and that's where you get it from. So let's look at Mr. Yannick Ngakwe. So last year, so he is, he's 25 years old, 6'2", 246 pounds. He was a third-round pick, number 69 overall by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, 2017, let's, let's start here. Let's, no, no, we'll, we'll get to that. In 2019, in terms of his overall PFF grade, let's start with that. I know some of you don't care about PFF. That's fine. We'll start with PFF for those that care, and then we'll move on to statistics. We'll just do the whole spectrum here. His overall defensive grade was a 72. A 72. Let me really quickly, because I should have had this up, but I don't yet. We'll go to overall edge rushers. We'll get rid of all the people that didn't play here, and we'll put it in order. We've got Yannick. He was graded as the 33rd best pass rusher in football in 2019. 33rd. So we're paying him as though he's one of the top pass rushers. For uh, reference, just looking in the NFC North, Darius was graded as the second best. Uh, Daniil Hunter was the seventh best, two very underrated guys. And I'll give credit where it's due. Um, Daniil Hunter is a very good pass rusher. At least he was last year. Same with Darius. We'll see which of those two can continue that um, or if they're both going to regress or one or the other or whatever. Khalil Mack was tied for 13th. Still elite, not throwing any shade. He just had a little bit of a down year, but still very, very, very elite, good, solid, whatever, right? Trey Flowers was 20th. So every single team has got a guy. By the way, Everson Griffin last year, 26th. So there's that. Um, So he was 33rd. And you think, well, last year was a down year. He had the exact same PFF grade in 2018, 72 in 2019, 72.7 in 2018. Same thing. His run defense grade is a 51.6. Yannick Ngakwe, again, 6'2", 246, is not a very big guy, and he is and always has been very consistently a terrible, terrible, terrible run defender. His grades over the four years. Now, for those that don't know PFF grades, and this is my terminology, but it's more or less the case, 60 is average. 70 is good. 80 is very good. 90 is elite. From 60, you got 50 is below average. 40 is bad. 30 is trash. 20 is heaping pile of garbage. Anything below that is you don't belong in the NFL. Not really true because it happens, but whatever. In 2016, his run defense grade was a 29.5, heaping garbage. He's since gotten better over the three years, 55.3, 59, and 51.6, meaning he's been a below-average run defender his entire career. Tackling grade, the last two years, 29.9 and 30. Putrid. Um, And then one of the outliers, and he only did it 15 times, but he had basically an elite coverage grade that's useless the Vikings aren't going to ask him to drop into coverage. The Jaguars almost never ask him to drop into coverage. It doesn't matter. But he's one of the best pass rushers. That's what you're missing. We're getting him because we want a pass rusher. We don't care about run defense. Yes, you do, first of all. But we care about pass rush. All right. Let's look at, first of all, we'll stick with PFF before we get to statistics. Let's sort it, all the edge rushers, by pass rush. Where did Yannick Ngakwe rank? He was 21st. He was behind... Um, 
Zadarius, he was behind Daniil Hunter, and he was behind Trey Flowers. So he's still not even one of the top guys based on that. And um, in terms of, well, he's been better in the past, 77.5 this year. Last year was a 76.8. So in terms of grades, he's good, not great. That's all he is. Again, remember, keep in mind, we're talking about an $18 million contract, and they gave up draft capital to capital to get a guy ranked in the 20s and 30s who's terrible against the run pretty good against the pass um as a pass rusher and um they gave up draft capital for that for a one-year plug that they may be extending but again this guy's not taking a small contract he's he's looking at it saying no i'd like 20 please and if you pay him you're stupid unless you can work it out and he accepts like a 16 million dollar a year deal then okay cool Let's look at statistics, though, for a second, because that's what it's all about. Um, In terms of total pressures, in 2019, he had 51 total pressures. Now, pressures aren't a super popular stat, so it's kind of like, well, what does that even mean? Well, for reference, Darius Smith led the NFL in pressure. Uh, No, he didn't, did he? Why is it saying he led? I thought uh, Bosa did. Anyways, Darius, for some reason right now, is saying uh, 93. 93. Daniil Hunter was number two with 88. So... 50s, Yannick, with 51, ranked 25th. Well, the, he didn't get as many snaps. Darius had 543 pass rush attempts, and Yannick only had 488. So you're not looking at the context and blah, 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 blah. All right, let's look at the context here. Um, Yannick and Gakwe. So this is another the, another stat that I really like, and it's, it's, it is the stat if you want to know how good of a pass rusher somebody is. It's very simple. You take the total pressures, and you divide it by the number of pass rush attempts. Why? Because the most important thing is, when I tell you, go get them, did you get them, right? Whether it's a sack, a hit, or a hurry, any kind of pressure that you can get, did you affect the quarterback? Did you get to the quarterback in some kind of way when I told you that's your job? Because I've been doing this a long time, 10% is the baseline, which means anything below 10% and you're trash. If you're at 10%, you're not very good, but it's it's acceptable, right? I think Rashawn Gary was around 10% whatever, Brian Burns, right, for rookie guys just getting their footing, 10% is acceptable, not super elite. 12 to 13%, now it's it's good, right? 12 to 13%, I think Kenny Clark is in that range, right? It's, it's you're a solid football player, not like super elite. The super elite guys are at like, f- you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, and usually even then it's only like one year that they can pull that off. So let's look at it. Let's look at some of these guys here. So Zadarius Smith, he had 93 pressures divided by 543 attempts. He affected the quarterback 17.1% of the time when he was told to go do that, right? 17.1. I'm pretty sure he was number one in the NFL in pressures, which is why he's extremely underrated. The fact that he didn't go to the Pro Bowl just goes to prove if you're one of the people that uses Pro Bowl to uh, say that so-and-so was good or bad, you need to stop. You absolutely have to stop because it's a joke. Daniil Hunter, 88 pressures, 562 attempts, 15.6%. That's elite. That's phenomenal. Uh, Cam Jordan, 83 divided by 593, 14%, still very good. Let's go down to Yannick, who's down here 25th in terms of total pressures, but, you know, he didn't have as many attempts. So let's just do the math. He had 51 pressures divided by 488 attempts, 10.4%. He just crossed the threshold of, congratulations, you don't completely suck. So, way to spend $18 million on that. Um, He had a grand total of eight sacks last year, compared again. Zadarius Smith had 16, Daniil Hunter had 15. Uh, Where's my other guys? Khalil Mack had nine, again, down year. But even Khalil, 70 divided by... Where's Khalil at? 70 divided by 531. He's even at 13. Which, again, down year for Khalil Mack is 13%, which is a really solid number. Yannick Ngakwe isn't on that level. Okay, well, he had a down year. He had a down year. He's better than this. Okay, well, in 2018, it was better. That's true. He had 10 sacks, which, cool, you crack double digits. And then 64 pressures, which is higher, divided by 497, puts him at 12.8%, which is good, not great. Okay, well, what about 2017? What about 2017? First of all, you're talking about one year. Not only that, the fact of the matter is 2017 is is very reminiscent of the 2018 Bears. The 2018 Bears, and this is what I've been saying, if you listen to the podcast, you've heard me say this a thousand times. If you don't listen to the podcast, you need to start listening to the podcast. Back on that podcast, all the information is somewhere in that direction, possibly that direction. I don't know. It's a mirror thing, and it confuses my brain. 
the 2018 Bears were an anomaly because you have a bunch of guys who are here, and then in 2018 they jump up here. They've been doing this, some of these guys, for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, right? Might be a slight exaggeration, but look at Prince of Mukamura. Prince of Mukamura had been steady Eddie at good, not great for like seven years, and then all of a sudden, like third best cornerback in the NFL. That's not sustainable. So I said the very obvious thing. This is everybody overperforming because the whole system is working. Everybody else is doing their job very, very well. And so this is unsustainable. Everybody is overperforming. So there's going to be a crash. They're not that good. And sure enough, the Bears crash. Now, Bears fans all say, well, that was, that was the anomaly, the down year. Now we're going to rebound. No, you're not. You're not going to re. You might be a little bit better because it's second year of the system. You're not going to relive the 2018 Bears all over again. That's, those days are done. This is the same situation. The 2017 Jacksonville Jaguars were an anomaly. They went out and got all these elite players, and everybody is so good because everybody else is so good. You're, as an edge rusher, your job is a lot easier when your corners are holding off guys longer. That's going to help your stats. When the interior guys are providing pressure, and you have to account for them. When the other edge rusher is providing pressure, everybody else being very good helps you to be even better because you don't have to account for everybody else. Generating pressure over here means you get more sacks. The whole nine yards, right? 2017 was the anomaly, not the other way around. Just look at his four years, his grades, 52, 81, 72, 72. You think that one year was was not the anomaly? Of course it was. Let's look at some of the other guys from that team. The Jacksonville Jaguars, by the way, 2017, the number one ranked defense in the NFL. Let's look at um, Jalen Ramsey. Uh, Jalen Ramsey, his grades over four years. 72.8, 91.3, 72.8, 71.5. Would you say Jalen Ramsey is probably in that 72 range like he's been three years, or is he a 91.3 like he was that one year? Which one is the outlier? It's the 2017 year, and he's not going to get back to that. He is a 72.8 guy. That one year was an anomaly, and teams are stupid for not recognizing that. They pay guys for that 2017 season because they don't recognize he's only playing that well because the entire defense is doing so well. He's not that. Look at Calais. Well, Calais is an outlier. Calais is just an absolute freak. Um, Yes, in 2017, that was one of his best years. It was his second highest overall year, but Calais Campbell is just a freak, and that's a whole separate conversation. The guy didn't even play well until year four. He didn't become very good until year one, two, three, four, five, six. His seventh season was the first time he cracked the 80s as far as PFF grade. And his ninth year was the first year he hit the 90s as an elite player. And he's been in the 90s for four years in a row. He's going to crack 100 by the time he's 60 years old. That man needs to get drug tested. That's all I'm saying because he's doing something crazy. Okay, let's look at uh, Paul Puzluzny. Uh Let's see, his grades from 2012, uh, 69, 63, 61, 60, 82, 87. I wonder if that has to do with something to do with the Jaguars going out and getting a bunch of free agents and all of a sudden everything's great because he wasn't that good. A.J. Boye, 60, 62, 58, 87, 84, 75, 58. This guy has been kind of terrible outside of these two years. Now, I do expect a little bit of a rebound just because I think Vic Fangio might be able to use him, kind of similar to Kyle Fuller, who's been kind of a bad foot. Bears fans will never admit this, but he's been a draft bust up until that 2018 season when he was a very good player, playing a lot of zone under Vic Fangio, which is what A.J. Boye is going to be doing, kind of similar to what he had in Jack. Plus, it's going to be, I think he's going to do a good job. But the point is, clear outlier when you look at 2017, also 2016. But the, those two years, clear outlier. Um, and then Telvin Smith, 63, 67, 73, 81.9, 63. Everybody overperformed. Everybody crashed immediately after. And I don't know of anybody, with the exception of, um, what's his name, Mr. Freak, that has, that has rebounded beyond what he's been able to do. And even Calais Campbell has just kind of maintained that level because it's, you're not going to beat 91 overall. So the point is, 2017 was a clear outlier. This is a guy whose overall PFF grade is around 22. His, his pass rush percentage is between 10 and 12%. He's going to get you 8 to 10 sacks on a season. That's just what he is. Now, he may do a little bit better over there in Minnesota. I don't necessarily know why. There's nobody along the interior that you like. Daniil Hunter also, as I said, is in prime candidate for regression, as is Zadarius. But let's just look at Daniil Hunter. 70, 77, 78, 77, 89. 
Which one's the outlier and, and sort of that regression to the mean? Do you think he's going to stay at 89 for the rest of his – maybe, maybe. He's 25 years old. Maybe this is going to be his thing. But but the idea that 25-year-old Daniil Hunter, who is this elite player, which he was, and I'll give him credit, and maybe he's going to maintain that. I, if, if I have to choose between Daniil regressing and Zadarius regressing or both of them maintaining, I'm going to go ahead and hope that they both kind of stay at that level because I need Zadarius to be very, very good. So I'm fine admitting that it might happen. But the, the, the narrative that you've got this 25-year-old elite Daniil Hunter and this 25-year-old elite Yannick is going to be the best pass rush duo in all of football, and it's just you can't do any better than It's just it's silliness. It's absolute silliness. Let me do one thing because I'm just curious here. So Everson Griffin, um, who had a lot more pressures, let's see what his percentage was last year. 66 divided by 547. So he was at 12% last year. So he did a better job last year than Yannick did last year. So I still think they're going backwards. So this is some, again, the narrative is you got Everson Griffin and then you got Daniil Hunter and then Yannick is like, he's like up here. He's, he's one of the best out there. No, it's Zadarius, then Daniil, then Everson, then, I mean, I don't know, you know, I put Zadarius just to be spiteful, but I don't want to go through all the guys because obviously Khalil Mack is better. I think Everson Griffin is better. I think Trey Flowers is better. I think Preston might be better, possibly. What was his? I know his pressure percentage wasn't all that great, although he did get uh, 13 sacks. No, he Preston was at 13%, so Preston's better. So Zadarius is better. Daniil Hunter is better. Uh, Everson Griffin is better. Um, Khalil is better. Trey Flowers is better. Everybody's better. So you're overpaying for this guy. And, if, and again, why did it take so long to come to this? Why did nobody want to give up a fifth-round pick? Why did nobody want to make this deal? This is a desperation move by the Minnesota Vikings who are watching a team that they know we can't field this team. We can't put Everson Griffin out there by himself and expect to be anything. We are a defensive team. That's our identity. We, we win up front. We win in the trenches. We attack the quarterback, right? That's what we do. We're coming. We can't, I can't field this. I'm going to get embarrassed with this team. So, again, they went out and got Pierce, and then he dropped out, and they're like, crap. So then they went out and got Hall or Hill or whatever his name is, and he failed his physical, and they're like, crap. And then somebody's like, well, what about Yannick? And he's like, no, we can't. What are we going to do? We can't afford that. We're in a cap nightmare. We got $12 million, and he want, he's worth 18 Well, we can extend him. That's a worse idea. Why are you even talking? Well, we got to do something. So they pull the trigger. This is a panic thing. Again, they're clearly better with him than without him. But this is not a prudent move. He's not as good as everyone's going to tell you he is. It's going to be a fifth-round pick because I think he has to be like first-team all-pro or something for it to move to a fourth-round pick, and then they have to win the Super Bowl for it to be a third-round pick. Neither of those two things are going to happen. So from this Packer fan, I'm not worried. You're clearly worse. You had Linval Joseph and Everson Griffin. You lost Linval Joseph and you downgraded Everson Griffin. I'm not panicked. In fact, I would rather you do this than not do this. Because, again, this is not a prudent move. I'm not scared of Yannick. I mean, I'm, I'm more scared of him than whoever it is you had there before. But I'm not worried about him being a game wrecker. Um, and you've just completely obliterated your cap, which already you guys are not doing a good job with that. It's, it's, it's causing problems, to say the least. Best of luck to you. Guys, thanks for watching. That's going to do it for this one. Please like the video. Don't forget to do that because, you know, I like that ratio to be as high as possible. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the little bell notification so you don't ever miss an episode. Plus, I'm planning to go live one of these days, but I know those things don't get a lot of views, and I just don't want it to be zero. If we can get to, like, 10, I can live with 10, but you're not going to know I'm going live if you don't hit the little bell thing, and that'll help to make that number bigger and, and make me less embarrassed and waste my time. So please hit the little bell notification so you don't miss any of these upcoming episodes. Um, what else? Check out the Packernet podcast. It is over that way, so I pointed the wrong way before. Check out the Packernet podcast. Basically what you heard today is pretty much what the podcast is five days a week going to be seven days a week. It's me just angrily ranting about things and calling people dumb for believing things that aren't true and telling you things that are lies and that upsets me. If you want reality, check out the Packernet podcast. Um, Packernet.com, a great place for all your uh, Packers news and information if you are a Packers fan or even if you're a Vikings fan, if you want to just know what's up with the Packers. It is a news aggregator, so it brings in news from all over. Again, hit the little gear icon and you can click and choose what news sources you want and 
don't want. Fan to Fan Network is the full spectrum. It's a part of the network. Uh, it's a network that I am a part of that is um, covered by actual fans of the teams. It's not blue check mark folks who don't actually know what they're talking about. It's it's diehard fans, most of which have YouTube channels like this one. So if you're not a fan of the Packers, go check that out and you can find your own sort of representative and whatnot. They've got a YouTube channel, FTFN. Go check that out. Otherwise, you folks have a good day.